Danny, all right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks for being here this evening. You're very welcome to Up Close and Personal once again in association with, with Hot Press. Thanks for being here. Thanks to everybody at the Grand Social um, for the very professional setup we're about to enjoy this evening. <laughs> Remember I said that. Um, for over a quarter of a century now, 25 years plus, Ash have been one of our most uh, consistent and indeed eclectic uh, of bands uh, over the course of nine albums. They've run the gamut from pop, punk, to punk, pop. They're not necessarily the same thing. Uh, grunge, what we had, we had a kind of a metal kind of thing. And uh, even electronic pop, and even more recently, even a bit of disco. And uh, one of our very, very best bands, I'm delighted to say, to discuss their debut album, 1977. I'm joined this evening, thank you. Uh, I'm joined this evening by the man chiefly responsible uh, for all the songs that you're about to enjoy on record and indeed live this evening. We're going to get a couple of live tunes out of them as well. Please welcome Mr. Tim Wheeler. It's great to see you. We're going to that thing and pretend we haven't been chatting downstairs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Ash, 1977. Um, 25 years, how does it feel? Uh, it doesn't quite feel like 25 years, really, but um, yeah, you know, like we still play a lot of the songs currently all the time, so you know, they're still with us all the time and they don't seem that, that could be that old, but yeah, I guess, you know, the world has changed so much since then, so. Uh, yeah, it does make sense that it was 25 years too. Yeah, I, I, I often find that with the, particularly with, with the way COVID's been, everything seems like it's been really dry, but everything seems to have gone really quickly as well. It's like the two things are happening at once, so, which is yeah. kind, of, kind yeah. of crazy. But time, when you, when you reach a milestone like that, uh, and you're kind of asked to, not forced to, but asked to kind of reflect on it, it must be strange. Yeah. But you were so, so young. Yeah, when, yeah, when we're, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I guess we were like 19 when it came out, and uh, a few, yeah, a few of the songs were sort of written when we were 18 as well, so it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, definitely sort of captured just the moment where I left school and uh, life was changed completely, like, especially like the minute a song like, like Go From Mars came out, that was two weeks after leaving school, so yeah, I think it's, you know, it's a real album of youth and our fans were super young as well at the same time, so the, that was, I don't know. Yeah, it's all <laughs> it's encapsulated in that. Yeah, do you feel, I mean, obviously you're saying you still play a lot of songs and you've performed the album and it's in its entirety of them on several tours, I think. Um, do you still relate to the songs in the same way? Does it feel like, does it still feel like you wrote them? Yeah, yeah, very much. Like, um, Go From Mars is still, you know, I get the energy. Like, I see it in the audience as well when we're playing it and I feel it, you know, it um, still has a big kick to it. And I think, yeah, it brings us back. Even, I'm sure even when I get old, I'll probably still Want to jump in the air? When, you know, well, that would be for at least another 60 years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I hope so. um, but we should start logically at the beginning. Uh, first track from the album, Lose Control. Can you tell us a bit about what was creatively going through your mind when you. It's a, it's a co write with Mark Hamilton, of course, yeah. but, uh, very importantly. Yeah. Um, it's. Uh, yeah, it was like, like half of the album was sort of written up front. Like, we had a lot of bunch of singles. Uh, came out the year before, like Kung Fu, Gulf Mars, and Angel Interceptor. Yeah, I remember. I thought they're just going to keep putting out singles. Yeah, no, it would have been nice. <laughs> <laughs> but all of a sudden we were like, okay, you have to make an album. And we used up most of our good songs to that point on the trailer, like uh, a couple of years before. So, yeah, so stuff like Loose Control was pretty much conjured up um, from some riffs that we had. You know, it was, all, it, it was all like half of it was thrown together quite quickly and um, luckily it ended up being good but uh some of the best stuff is yeah i mean so. apart from if you're doing joinery or something <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay it's well let's get started and let's hear it. lose control ash <laughs> rock and roll dynamics there yeah in action or to quote uh, tim Quick, no, the anthem's coming up. It's really sudden, it's really quick. Yeah. Uh, and you weren't lying. Um, lose Control by actually fine way to start an album. Um, and the live show as well, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, great. it's just a cracking kind of opener in general, and including live chats like this. Oh, yeah. um, so, 
I thought Bandanera is wearing a t-shirt that has pretty much almost like a, a prompt card for my first question. 1977 in 1996, uh, numerology aside, yeah. why 1977? Is it just as simple as we were born in 1977? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I, there's also like a couple of our favorite things were either from there, yeah. but obviously like punk, punk rock was, you know, really broke through, and yeah. Star Wars, of course. Ah. Yeah. Do you know what, what was that? It took him. Eight minutes. <laughs> Eight minutes to bring up stars. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a. It's it's an interesting year culturally. Actually. Yeah, a lot, a lot yeah. Of stuff happening. Also, it's a big part of our childhood. So, and yeah. um, I guess we're still clinging hard to childhood for uh, most of our careers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, did you identify uh, initially because you started so young? I mean, you're quite precocious actually, and I don't mean that in a bad way. But how old, what age were you when you first became, I know you were a, a little band at school, but I mean, yeah. that's, that's the beginning, and beginnings are important. What, what, what age was that at? Um, I think we had this band called Vietnam in school, yeah. and I think that was like 12, 13, 14 or so, or maybe 13, 14. And uh, yeah, then 15, was 15 years old, so we got Ash together, me and Mark, and uh, Rick was 16. He was the oh. year above us in school. Yeah. Oh, he was, he was the old man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, we uh, it was sort of crazy. Old. And what was the impetus? Just I think uh, I don't know. We really wanted. I just felt like we wanted to do something very different. And I think I found in Mark someone else who would get crazy obsessed about something. And uh, mm. for a while he was like, "We're going to start an American football team because that was like <laughs> <laughs> the rage." And he was like trying to figure out ways to get a league started for that. And then. I don't know, that somehow then Iron Maiden and stuff started getting influencing us and then we were like, okay. Then he was like, we'll start a band. So like, there's about six or seven of our mates all got guitars one Christmas. And uh, I think gradually- The game was afoot. Yeah, like we'd, we'd get together every Saturday and gradually the people who would show up would end up, you know, getting down to just me, Mark and our friend Malcolm. So uh, yeah, and then we were like, okay, we'll start a band with this. And how long was we were very bad. No, well, yeah. well, I guess most bands are not great when they start. But how long was it before, or what? When was it that you maybe first went? Oh, hang on. There's maybe something. We, we may actually be quite good at this. Um, I think that's maybe when we were fifteen, and <clears throat> that sort of we had had a couple of pretty embarrassing shows in in Dan Patrick, and. Uh, uh, I can tell a sort of long-winded story if you want to hear it. If you don't, uh, I had a, I started off like wanted to be the singer of this band, this heavy metal band, Vietnam, and uh, we used to go to our uh, down our local market, and there's a guy selling heavy metal tapes, and I went in, and uh, I was like, we're starting a band, and he's like, oh, play me your demo sometime, and uh, I was the singer on the demo, and he was like, he didn't know that, but he was like. The music's good, but you gotta get rid of the singer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so then I was like, so then we got this other guy in Cookie for a while, but he uh, would do gigs and he had stage fright, so he'd just walk off stage and I'd end up having to sing anyway. So. <laughs> and then, yeah, um, I'm, I'm a bit like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I haven't walked off yet, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the temptation's there. Always. Yeah. Ever present. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, then all of a sudden, like, stuff like Nirvana. Um, came around and we were like, oh, you don't have to be a perfect singer really to, to do this as long as you've got passion. And uh, so then I think that's kind of coincided. Luckily, we're starting to write good songs and that's when we honed in on Ash. Yeah, so, I, yeah. so in, in a sense, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this in, in a second because we want to get you to the, to the microphone. And right. <laughs> um, but we'll, we'll come back to it. But there was a, was Nirvana then and the grunge thing, the early part of the 90s, the whole Seattle thing, was that kind of your pistols moment, yeah, if yeah. you like. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Okay. Um, and the melodic thing was always also so strong. I think, yeah. that, that, I think that those two things together is what really your, it continues to be your strength, actually. You can, you can punch very hard, but it's always, for the most part, yeah. very melodic. Is yeah, that I mean, an innate thing or something that you actually went for? Yeah, I think it was innate, because we, you know, we had all this sort of aggression and you know, energy we wanted to get out early on, but mm. I still, I had, you know, still loved pop music since I was a kid, you know, so I loved strong melodies and, uh, yeah, I think, I think, you know, there's a brand, that was a good thing about grunge, you had bands like Nirvana and Teenage Fan Club, or, you know, say, who had power, but, you know, and, and dirt around them, but also, like, real pop, great songwriting in there yeah. too, so. Very much so. I think that, yeah, that enabled, and simplicity too, so that suited much more our musicianship early on as well, and that's, that set us off. And, yeah, we loved all the yeah, strong melodies, that's the main 
Don't forget to write a good chin. Yeah, and, absolutely. Absolutely. and it's a, it's an oft repeated kind of cliche, which I'm going to repeat again. That uh, <laughs> the mark of a mark of a, a good song is if you can just play it on an acoustic guitar, and it still oh, sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> Let's find out if that's true. Oh no, okay. <laughs> uh, because the next track, uh, as you know, if you're a fan of of the album, is Goldfinger. We're going to get a, a live performance of that right now. All right here we go. Which I'm very grateful. All right, <laughs> Some records on, and 
And some bottles of wine On a stormy night The rain is lashing down And I'm waiting for her stores and things and um, I, I much prefer kind of rocking out you know yeah. but there's there's something kind of fun about it it's very very different yeah good good yeah um, I'm gonna let you get your breath back before we, before okay. we press on with this <laughs> and we're gonna be returning to Girl From Mars a bit later on but for now second single right from the album yeah uh, let's have it from 1977 and we'll be discussing more about that album and indeed the band that made it in just a few minutes after um, yes Girl From Mars from Ash Yes, Girl From Mars, um, it's one of your quintessential, kind of, it's, it's the, one of the great Irish identifiers, isn't it? Yeah, and it's an evergreen one, it still, like, still gets the reaction. I was sort of saying, there's no way that bit that sort of song where we kick in and everyone just throws their pints in the air. Yeah. You know? <laughs> if you've just been to the bar, you're probably like, oh, fuck it. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, yeah, it always kicks off. And as I was saying, they don't always just come back down on the ground. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, sometimes, so, sometimes they go somewhere. Their themes, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, was that one of the ones you were saying you, you, weren't, you weren't sure if you had a, a, enough songs? Was that, was that one of the ones that you had to come up with quickly, or was that one? Of no, that, that was when we actually um, wrote that one of sixteen. So that was like okay. quite um, quite early on, and uh, we did. Oh, of course, it was just the second single. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, we, we yeah. didn't put it on trailer because uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the management and the record label. They sort of were like, this song is a potential hit, you know, but don't don't put it out while you're still at school. That's you, we got to hold this back. So we didn't. We could have recorded it on trailer, but we didn't because they were like, there's no point putting it out if you can't promote it properly. Yeah. So, and they were right. So, you know, um, absolutely. Kind of, Sometimes I mean, the management are right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was one of those rare times. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> how was all that uh, kind of talking to record companies and dealing with managers and? Agents and you know big grown up rock and roll industry stuff when you're still at school and trying to get through A level. Well, A level yeah. at that stage, right? Yeah, I was mad. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, like the lawyers and all would have to come to our our houses to get our parents to sign record deals right. and stuff because <laughs> we were 17. You know, we were actually legally allowed to sign our own contracts. And uh, so yeah, it was it was it was kind of it was cool. Uh, we we got in with a good bunch. So we're lucky, you know. Yeah. And, I think you know our parents intimidated them a bit as well. They were like, "Oh, we got to like do well by these, by these people. We're you know we're trusting our their kids with us." So you know, uh, it could have could have been way worse. You know, and they, they were great. Yeah. And your parents obviously very supportive. Though. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. They were. I'm sure they were nervous, um, but they were dead excited. You know, and like stuff happened. Like when we got from Mars, we were on top of the pops. You know, it was like <laughs> first big hit, and the, the yeah I think Ulster Television sent right a news crew to. To film Mark's parents watching us on TV, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, they loved it. You know, that's cool. I mean, but still, that kind of was, to be catapulted into that. Yeah. That age. How did you get on with the others, by the way? Uh, I got two B's in the C, so it was all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it was okay. I got two B's in the C, and then I ended up working at the BBC. Uh, <laughs> you're rock star too, though. Man. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Yeah, but Rick got three A's, and he, but he finished what? Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> he finished the year before us, and he, he tried to go to university for a bit, and he actually missed a couple of tours because he was like, I'm at university now, but then he sort of caught on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> First day. I know, yeah. Uh, what were your subjects? Um, English, maths, and French. Oh, do you that? Yeah, I think the C was English. Maths, I can't remember, yeah. English, Spanish, and French. Ah, yeah. Don't speak a word of Spanish or French. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I barely speak English, actually. Yeah, um, yeah so uh, uh, one of those people around that time, one of those people who was guiding you, sadly, we, we, we lost him not very long That's ago. That's right, yeah. Um, a gentleman by the name of Steve Strange. Can you yeah. just tell uh, people who may, might be familiar who uh, was yeah. and what he did? Well, it's nice to bring him up. Um, he was our first agent, and, well, our only agent up to now, and uh, yeah, he died like a couple of weeks ago. 
And uh, but it, we were his first band at break, and he was he's from Carrick Fergus. He was you know, dead proud of us right from the get go, and uh, went on to be Eminem's agent, uh, Coldplay's, Queens of Stone Age, like you know massive bands. But and uh, yeah, Snow Patrol of course as well. Uh, but yeah, we all we started out together. He he used to book the limelight. He was a promoter in there, and Mark used to go up to him and bring our demo tape and beg him to let us support whoever was coming through, you know, could we support Sonic Youth or someone? And we, and we got some good gigs like uh, Babes in Toyland and Ride and stuff. He, he started pushing them or, or pushing us their way. Mm. And then he moved to London just as we were, we were taking off. So, uh, yeah, so we, yeah, we had a great history with him. And yeah, it's going to be kind of hard moving forward without him. But we'll... And he's revenge, your, your guy. Yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm terribly sorry for your loss. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I'd like to respectfully dedicate actually this uh, edition of Up Close and Personal oh, to the memory of, of the great yeah. Steve Strange. I'll um, take a sip. <laughs> I'll sit for a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Cheers. Strange. Because guys like that are important. I mean, they're important for any band. They're important for any musician. Yeah. He was a guy. Well, particularly like, when you're so young. Absolutely. And yeah, he was the kind of guy you'd think would always be around. And yeah, he definitely lived hard. But you thought he, he was indestructible, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Far too yeah. young. Um, another figure from that time, very important, of course, the, uh, essentially how an album turns out is the producer. Yeah. And in your case, uh, Owen Morris. I mean, I remember Owen Morris, I first became aware of Owen Morris when he did the first electronic album. That's with right, yeah. With Bernard Sumner and Johnny Marr, of course. Yeah. And a great job he did on it, but, uh, but a f miles away from what he would then become most well known for, which yeah. was um, the Oasis, the first two um, Oasis records. Yeah. Which did quite well, as far as I know. Yeah. Um, I used to go around his house, he had like a, his, his coffee table was a 10 times platinum album of, you know, of <laughs> 10 platinum discs of the Oasis, One Story, Morning Glory, in the middle of his, his dining room, or living room, it, yeah. It beats putting them in the downstairs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but yeah have that, you ever seen a 10 times platinum album? It's yeah, for, wild. Yeah. I mean, a cr crazily successful producer, and, and deservedly so, I mean, did such a yeah. fine job. And, and a perfect producer, producer for you, but uh, how did you, uh, how, how did that come about? Because he would have been way up there at that point and you would have been, you know, just yeah. getting started. Actually, well, we, no, we kind of coincided. Hang on, I'm trying to think. Because he was producing um, the Verve album, Northern Soul. Right. And when we did Kung Fu and Angel Interceptor, and it, it was in the middle of his, their Christmas break. So what, that was 90, the end of 94. Right. I think, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I think he was, you know, he was just, like maybe the Oasis stuff was just starting to come out, you know, he wasn't, okay. and I think, I can't remember if he got the Oasis gig because of the Verve stuff, or or if it was the other way around, uh -huh. you know, because I know those bands were tight, but, uh, and yeah, we were, yeah, he was sort of, he was the hot shit producer that, and uh, yeah, it was, you know, our, our manager was like, you should check out this guy. Let's let's try a couple of tracks. So yeah, we went along in their Christmas break, and um, he was completely fucked because it was, <laughs> it was their, they'd been doing so many drugs making a Northern Soul, and right. he was so sick. And but somehow we got in. We we were meant to be doing Angel Interceptor as a single, but uh, and we bashed out Kung Fu at the same time. And then everyone was like, "Oh, Kung Fu should be the single." But uh, yeah, he he was a big party animal. He was. He was a maniac. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> you can't see it from there, but there's this look in Tim's eyes yeah. when he said that. This haunted look that yeah. tells you uh, all you need to know. Yeah, um, but I mean, he's, he was brilliant. He gave us a lot of confidence. And uh, I've, it's interesting talking back to the electronic stuff because, you know, he, I think he learned a lot. He was always talking about what Johnny or Bernard Sumner would do, you know, and that was, you know, they were big influences in how he saw everything. So yeah, so but we were sort of making our those 1977. Kind of, well, I feel like we made it. It was, it was alongside all that Morning Glory kind of time. We were in the same studio, Rockfield, as okay. Them. And actually, we went along. Oh, and the night they finished was the story Morning Glory. I remember like we went along to hear the final mix. The night that Noel mixed, you know, they finished the mixes, and Noel walked out, and we went in and. Ah. We just stayed up all night listening to it, so it was kind of ran very much around the same time. Of yeah. course, you, you sort of think with release dates, you go, it's all very chronological, but you know, yeah. before all that, a lot of stuff overlaps, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And what was, it was recorded at the legendary yeah. Rockfield um, in re Residential Studio. There was a great documentary about uh, Rockfield recently. I'd love to see it, oh, yeah. you, you Check it, it out. It's a great, yeah, we spent a lot of our formative time there, yeah. And it's residential, so you can do whatever the hell you like. I mean, that's, yeah. and did you? Oh, pretty much, yeah. Like Owen was a bad influence, and yeah, he, but we would do anything he said. You know, he'd be like, 
Okay, today we're going to go into the charity shop and we're all going to get dresses and you're going to play in those dresses. And, <laughs> and I don't know what musical, you know, it, it, way it made the album better, but uh, I don't know, it sort of... Is that on one of Brian Eno's wee cards now? Hey, it might have been, yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> send the band into t in the bomb. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but but he was great with songs. I don't know, he pushed me hard. Like, he was always like, those lyrics aren't good enough, go back right. and rewrite them or... He was great at arranging songs, even like Goldfinger as well. He was like, um, he came over to Northern Ireland and we had a couple of days, like a weekend probably in our, the cottage where we used to rehearse by my mom's and my dad's house. Mm. And he was just trying to desperately get, go through all our song ideas. And I think I went through everything I thought was good. And he was like, have you got something else? And then eventually I was like, oh, Goldfinger, this is like a weird little one. I don't, I think this is a B-side or something. And he was like, you idiot, that's a single. Oh, you know? wow. yeah. So, uh, but yeah, I don't think that may never have got done if he hadn't, you know, said, oh, well, that's really good. So it was like tough love. Yeah, yeah, he was very tough, yeah. Tough love and throw on this frock. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Curious mixture of approaches there. Yeah, yeah. And maybe if it weren't for the cross-dressing, it just wouldn't have... It wouldn't have been, been as good. Yet. Yeah, <laughs> you can hear it, listen. You know, yeah. All sorts of things can influence a performance, I found, and not just the obvious things. Yeah. You know, your attire. We used to actually do stuff like we would go out on every track and we would record, he'd set up a mic and we'd stand around the mic going like this. <laughs> For the whole, we'd do a take called the vibe track. <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're just like pointing at the mic. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's, what, that's another of his techniques. <laughs> Imagine soloing that one on yeah. classic albums. <laughs> just be us like shuffling around and sniffling and laughing, yeah. That is mad, yeah. uh, literally. Um, <laughs> I we, guess we had too big a budget. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, yeah. I'm going to be trying that now. Yeah. You're sending the vibes in. <laughs> you know, I can feel it. Yeah. I can feel it, it, Tim. I don't know if it's just the yeah. power suggestion, but I think you might be onto something. Or yeah. Owen Morris <laughs> might have been onto something. Um, we're coming now to track number four. Actually, we probably need to get, get a move on with these tracks, I suppose. I um, I'd give you anything. Can you tell us a bit about this before we hear it? Yeah, well, you'll hear a strong Stooges influence in I this. I think I did. Uh, yeah, yeah. And... Uh, I want to give a shout out to someone in the audience. My friend Barry's here, and he's, hey Barry, yeah, he was in a band called Laser Gun Nun, and a, oh, great name, yeah, <laughs> and also Backwater and Torgus Valley Reds. But um, you were talking about early, you know, when we sort of got the Ash sound going, and there was the Nirvana stuff happening and all that. But um, another thing was Barry's band. They were like this, you know, punk rock bands, and they were playing Stooges songs. Uh, you know, they did some of our first gigs in school. We were both doing a lot of gigs together, and uh, you know, I think. He really turned us on to all, all that stuff. And, um, Owen was like, okay, just slow this track way down. Do, do a Stooges kind of thing on it. So that's, uh, that's how this one came out. Yeah, low slung and nasty. Yeah. I'd give you anything, Ash. <laughs> Yeah, that is, uh, that is powerful stuff for a bunch of young fellas, now, in fairness. Yeah, I think, I think that was Owen's transformation of us, so, you know, it's probably... So all this? Yeah, was... yeah, it's a vibe track, yeah. <laughs> and I, we'd also started, we'd done that fair bit of touring in that time, just like the six months um, from leaving school. We, we were on the road a lot, you know, we went to Japan and America and Australia and all that for the first time, so we, we'd sort of clocked up a lot more gigs under our belt, and... Um, but yeah, he, I don't know, he just added a big power to the sound. That was Owen, really. Yeah, and you mentioned your friend that, did, that kind of turned you on to the studio. And it could be clearly there. Yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's its own thing, too, not, not to take anything away from it, but a clear influence. Yeah. Um, I, I was just speaking to you earlier before we, before we came on about where you were getting all this. Yeah. Because, as again, they trot out another cliche. It's not like there was the internet or Spotify in those days. I know, um, yeah. it, it, were, were, did you have a lot of friends who were kind of turning you on to kind of older stuff that, you, they, that they, they thought might feed into what you were doing? No, you just need one friend like Barry. Okay. Yeah. Come on, Barry. <laughs> yeah. no, it's good. I guess we, we did sort of end up in a circle of like bands and playing you know, small gigs in Northern Ireland. And um, yeah, you know, I guess Nirvana were cool about that too. You know, they were like, um, they took the Buzzcocks out in tour, so they they probably introduced, introducing new generations to yeah. that. And and I had a, an English teacher who gave me a, a Clash and an Undertones record. Oh my god! <laughs> as well, uh, a that, person of great taste. Yeah, he had great taste. Yeah, Mr. Park. So uh, Mr. Park. Well yeah. Done. So yeah, there was a, there was a few lucky uh, meetings of people. You did get a lot of comparisons, didn't you? I mean, yeah. because you were you were very much part of that. 90s thing that was happening, just yeah. you know, post post grunge and 
particularly in Ireland, I think, and particularly in maybe Northern Ireland, there were bands like Therapy yeah. and Joyrider, yeah. a band that I remember from back in the day, and uh, yeah, a few, few other bands. Um, kind of coming from that that uh, kind of grunge and almost a bit of that Washington hardcore influence kind of yeah. creeping into it as well. And then there's bands like Dinosaur Jr. and Formant and everything. But you would get a lot of, you'd get those kind of reference points, but a lot of people would go, oh, it's kind of buzzcocksy or, yeah. or even undertonesy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, people were, people were spotting that in us kind of before we'd even heard some of it, you know, so... Yeah. I, I don't really know what, I think it was because we liked the, the fast songs and we liked energy, but we liked puffy melodies and yeah. uh, short snappy songs. Uh, we might, we probably were stuck originally getting it secondhand through the Nirvana thing, you know. Yeah, uh, it's but we were just like, yeah. we were naturally gravitating to be more poppy, but uh, yeah, yeah, it was like, I did see the Buzzcocks years later and I was like, especially seeing them live, you know, where it's a big, full, powerful sound. I was like, oh, we are, you know. We are very, you could easily say we were a big rip off of them for sure, but it yeah, wasn't but, purpose. No, no, I, I, yeah. I, I wasn't suggesting that at yeah, all. I, 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 yeah. I just think it's interesting that you got those comparisons because yeah. funnily enough, it, it had been a little while um, since I'd, I'd sat down with, with 1977 and obviously in preparation for this, I listened to it you know, a few times through. And in my head, the way memory can kind of trick you, yeah. You sort of go, oh yeah, you know, I remember. I kind of remember it being yeah. like that. But then I'm listening to it going, it's not so much the God at all. It's just more closer to the kind of Nirvana thing of having powerful tracks yeah. alongside well, with great melodies, but also alongside proper melodic kind of stuff. And it's, there's a kind of a curious, well, not curious, but there's a definite striking tension almost between those two things. Or, or but it works. It's a kind of a balance between those two things on 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 the record throughout. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a lot. There's quite a lot of layers to it. Then um, I got a song like Goldfinger is definitely not a free chord punk song. You know, it's, it's I was sort of getting into quite complex. Yeah. Chords, shape, chord progressions, and uh, yeah, you know, you're, you're, you're saying earlier that um, there's, you know, wondering what sort of influences were going into it. But um, I remember like Owen had a lot of CD, you know, he had the Stooges CDs sitting around. Mm. He had Bowie and Beatles, obviously, because he's, you know, Oasis stuff. And but he also had like John Barry. You know, I loved this really complex chord things. So um, yeah, it's kind of slipping that in as well. Yeah. Yeah, and the sci-fi, of course. I, I forgot to yeah. mention Girl from Mars. Oh, Girl from Mars is probably one of the more obvious ones where people go, oh, yeah, yeah Buzzcocks. Yeah. But then you listen and you go, well, not kind of, but not really. Yeah, yeah. But the sci-fi thing is definitely something that's threaded yeah. throughout. Yeah, one. yeah. We, um, we used to rehearse in this co our cottage, and uh, it used to be my big sister's den, and she she was a big Bowie fan, so she had right. uh, she had Life on Mars written up on the wall, and we were like, what is that? And I think that was maybe a subconscious kind of thing as well. And I love Pixie's album, Trompe Monde, as well, which is all about like sci fi aliens. Yeah. 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 Well, so, Mars, actually. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the Olympus yeah. Mons. And, uh, yeah. It's a big mountain of Mars. It is, honestly. It didn't make up. Yeah. Um, speaking of string arrangements and things, I think the first time the strings really, well, certainly strike me are, are, in, are on the, the, uh, the next track, aren't they? Gone the Dream. Yeah. They've got a big kind of string thing going on. Yeah. Uh, let's listen to it first and then we'll okay, talk yeah. about what, what went into the, the production and the arrangement on that one. Gone the dream. Yeah. It's kind of rather wistful and, you know, yeah. a bit like that for a, <laughs> yeah. a, a man of your tender years. Um, and to go with exactly such a sort of a mood, those beautiful strings. Um, yeah. I mean, that's the thing about this album. It's, it's quite multifaceted. Yeah. Um, the strings then, who, who, who put all that together? Was that Owen Morris or who? who yeah, I don't think we would have had the idea to work with, you know, strings on, on unless we were with Owen, but... Um, yeah, the John Barry thing, yeah. Yeah. Did he actually do them though? Well, no, it was a, a guy called Nick Ingham who right. did like um, Massive Attacks on Finnish Sympathy oh and stuff God. like that. And I think he I think he did History on the Northern Soul for the Verve. Oh, uh, that's a, that string thing on that's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, so I think that was how Owen got got him in for that. Right. And then Owen was like, oh, we need some strings on the album. And I think because like Girl from Mars and Angel and Scepter had been hits, they were like, we had a bit of a budget. So uh, he was like, <laughs> oh, we've got to use this budget. And uh, so, yeah, we, we got those. So, um, and was it the full, is it like a, a quartet, yeah, octet, or the full I multi? Think, I think it was a 30 piece on oh my the Yeah, and Connor's Dream might have been a smaller one, like an eight, eight piece, but yeah. it, was, it was a magic day. Like the, the day doing a string session, you know, was uh, you go in and hear your, your tracks transformed. So, it might, yeah, it must be incredible because you've got very much an idea of a song in your yeah. head, and then somebody else yeah. is coming at it from a completely different angle. People, yeah. you know, who, who, 
you know, but we sort of we, and... what we would do is um, I think we'd sit there and we, we'd sing into like a dictaphone like over the track, you know, sort of like well we hear like yeah. <laughs> whatever you know melody we were kind of hearing, and we'd, tell, we'd say okay, sit out this verse and come in here, things like that, and uh, yeah, and they just got to transcribe that. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, because because you got the budget. Yeah, yeah. but there's things like oh yeah, you can hear, there's um. Uh, a Life on Mars references during the... No, 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 I did spot it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Honestly, I did. Yeah. <laughs> no, I did. <laughs> I really did. I spot all that stuff, you yeah. know me. Um, we, 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 we should press on, I guess. So we're we're going to come to another live performance very, very uh, shortly, um, if you just be a little more patient, uh, an acoustic version of Oh Yeah, one of your big songs. We're going to be hearing that in just a couple of minutes. Um, but first, though, uh, another, well, another big song, and... Um, not the hit it should have been, frankly. Yeah, well, Kung Fu. Yeah, it came out before everything. You know, it's like just off the back of trailer, and uh, I think it came out during our like Easter break when we were like seventeen or something like that, or <laughs> I don't know, whatever it was. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's no, it's it's kind of, I think I just packed in my yeah. paper round. <laughs> it kind of was in the middle, of, yeah, of everything, and uh, but I think it, I think it went to forty-one in the charts. It almost oh! went in the charts, but it got good support. Like, you know, it started getting played in the radio and. Uh, it did become a big live favorite. It was it was quite big on the radio. I heard yeah. it a lot on the yeah. radio, and then it just I, you know I was surprised that it didn't it didn't do a lot better. Um, before we hear it, just very very briefly, we should talk about the sleeve, of course. Uh, yeah. the, the famous Cantona kick. Yeah, that was great. Like it was um, the week we were trying to come up for the artwork, and I think we'd been in LA meeting record companies, and we'd done a photo shoot on the beach, like of us, you know, doing kung fu, and Mark wasn't there, but we were like, oh, this might be kind of cool. But then all of a sudden, uh, uh, Cantona. <laughs> Yeah, attacked the Crystal Palace, support, you know, racist supporter, which is great, and uh, with the Kung Fu kick, and we're like, okay, yeah, that's the album cover, uh, or, the, you, or the single cover. Uh, and, uh, what, did you have to go and ask the, the great man permission to use Yeah, we did. Well, the we back didn't, of his head? He's not really no, in it. He's kind of, kind of the back of his head. Yeah, you know? there's only one country where we needed his permission, and that was France. Right. And he said, I spit on your record. <laughs> so we, we had to have a different cover there. <laughs> not a fan, then? No, yeah. Oh, my God. So, yeah. You think somebody is? You think somebody like him would know when something's cool? Yeah, but oh. I thought that was even cooler. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, uh, Kung Fu is, is this another reflection of your did all that Jackie Chan stuff? Yeah, uh, yeah. There was. This, I, I thought this was a real throwaway song, and it was when we were going to record Angel Interceptor in our Christmas break, and mm. I remember there was like, uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> what we did on our holiday. Yeah. yeah. Well, I just, I just got a few Ramones albums for the first time. I was like, I was so right. into that. And then also there was a Jackie Chan season on Channel 4. They were showing all his films. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, uh, I'm going to write a Kung Fu song. Also, I heard that um, our manager told us that at uh, Ramones shows, they used to like get ninjas on stage to like just, uh, kick off crowds, you know, stage invaders and stuff. So I, a little excessive, but yeah. So somehow I thought that this kind of combined, and, and I was like, oh, I'm going to write a song about that. Sometimes the universe is just telling yeah. you, telling you <laughs> yeah. where it's going to go. I thought B-side, but uh, apparently not. Oh yeah. no, no, I love it. Kung Fu, yeah. Ash, and then oh yeah, life in just a minute. I spit on Eric Cantona. Yeah. <laughs> Don't tell him I said that. Yeah. Uh, Kung Fu, pretty, pretty stuff. And we should mention, because we were just enjoying that, listening to it back, and, and, and the guys, you know, just yeah, so strong on that. I mean, it's just so... Yeah, Rick's energy, energy yeah. Incredible. He's, I love the whole percussion breakdown as There's well. There's a great breakdown in, in, yeah. in, in the middle. Um, fantastic. It's, it, it must be great having those two guys yeah. there. Uh, absolutely, you know? yeah, yeah. It's just... No, the, the way we... Um, together it's uh, we were so locked in after all these years but all even then years, yeah. yeah it must be yeah. so kind of second nature kinetic at this stage it's absolutely just yeah plug in and off you go but yeah so hard to get to that point I know, as yeah. well you're, <laughs> yeah. so, you're so lucky when you do yeah um okay we, we've come to uh, another acoustic performance this evening one of is this the start of side two by the way I think. I what way does it, it go on the yeah. <laughs> just to confirm have we <laughs> yeah. is it is it the point of no return yeah we're on side B. Well, hey, <laughs> it's official. It's, it's side two on an album. That better not be called side B. 
I'm afraid it is. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Well, far from a B-side, yeah. uh, one of your greatest A-sides, no question about it. Let's just hear the performance first and then we'll talk about it because there will be quite a deal to say about the brilliant, oh yeah, if you, are you all right there? No. <laughs> is that thing trying to consume Yeah, you? the surface right. eating me. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, Tim Wheeler, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We just got something very special there, didn't we? That was just tremendous. Um, and how fitting you should play that summer anthem 
on this typical late October summer's day. <laughs> I know, yeah. In, in the fine city of Dublin. What weather we had today. Um, it was an omen. Yeah, was, I, think, it, I hope so. Yeah. It was always going to be thus. Uh, someone brilliant. arrived. Um, that's got to be one of your favourites. Yeah, it is, yeah. Yeah, it's um, always great to play live and people you know, sing along and I feel like it, I don't know, yeah, it captures you know, a certain time in, in my life as well. You know, it's that sort of, it's a real kind of coming of age song. It totally is. And I think yeah. for a lot of people, it literally was. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, so it, it's kind of guaranteed to always have that resonance. I think a fair few people lost their virginity to sound as well, <laughs> from what I've heard. Do you know what? I was trying yeah. to sort of dance around that and yeah. sort of imply it without yeah. saying it, but, you know, you had to go there. Yeah. Um, did you know, at the, so to speak, did you yeah. know um, w when you had it, was it one of those ones where you went, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. I think I, think I remember writing it quite like, late at night and uh, I think my, my folks had gone to sleep, so I had to like play it really quietly. Right. I was like, oh, that's a great chorus. So... Yeah, uh, I, I think that was one of the first songs that I played to Owen Morris, you know, when he came to Northern Ireland and we were going through the songs. That was one of the ones, along with Loose Control, I think. We were like, these should be dead certs. Yeah. And yeah. fifth, I've, got, I've made a note here, fifth single yeah. from the album. Yeah. Um, and maybe, of course he had all those singles before the album yeah. arrived, but was there a temptation to just keep going? <laughs> I think we would have liked to, but then we were like, oh, we don't want to milk it too much. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah, we thought enough's enough, leave room for coming back with something. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, Let It Flow is uh, the song that succeeds it, uh, followed by Innocent Smile, of which more later. Um, but for now, Let It Flow, tell us quickly before we hear it, Let It Flow is... Um, yeah, this is, I'm trying to think. It's quite a teenage fan club, this one, in some ways. You know, like, that's a... That's another big influence on us. And Again, that melodic, yeah, but loud. Yeah, and another band, like Lemonheads as well, they did that well in, the, you know, in those, those days, like sort of dirty pop songs. So I feel like this sort of fits in with that stuff. And would bands like that then have led you back to, say, I don't know, Big Star or The Velvets or...? Yeah, oh, definitely, yeah. Yeah, yeah we sort of got more, more, we dug deeper more for like nuclear sounds into yeah. the influences of our influences. <laughs> yeah. Very good, very yeah. well put. Uh, Let It Flow from Ash, let's hear from the album. It was called Let It Flow, the one before, so we did. We let it flow um, yeah. into uh, Innocent Smile. And uh, we've got to talk about this, not, not to dwell on it at all, but Innocent Smile. Um, you very quickly, uh, back then, established uh, something of a reputation for being slightly less than innocent, it's fair to say. Yeah. Um, with the uh, on-the-road hijinks and the partying and all that sort of... Hijinks, yeah, I did say it. <laughs> yeah. uh, how deserved was that and how much do you think it kind of... Was it maybe a bit of a, maybe it became a bit of a pain? Oh, yeah, it was a pain because when we went to uh, Norway one time, they'd taken the mini bar and the TVs out of a room <laughs> in case they found it. They were like, they, they read some magazine articles, they thought we were going to like trash the place. So, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, like, I guess we were, you know, young lads just all of a sudden with like every day a fridge full, completely full of booze and, uh, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think I was very well behaved, but Mark and Rick, <laughs> <laughs> they were... <laughs> Who strangely aren't here tonight. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> to answer for themselves, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and the way, I think we all got a bit carried away at times, but it was, uh, yeah, you know. You're young. Yeah, we were young, yeah. You know. All young. our mates at university or whatever were doing the same thing, except not being written about or didn't have journalists tagging That's, along. You know? That is a very fair point. Yeah. Uh, absolutely very fair point. Uh, you mentioned, uh, uh, they're not here, but you, you, yeah. did, uh, you <laughs> yeah. mentioned them. And uh, uh, the next song, actually, Angel Interceptor, while that was playing, the, the, the last track, um, Innocent Smile, we were talking about, uh, that was a bit, a bit more of an influence uh, from Mark uh, in terms of what, what he was into. Uh, yeah. Was there much of a... Was there a three-way thing? Were you all on, on very much the same page or was there kind of a three-way? So Mark's bringing a bit of Sonic Youth yeah. in and maybe Rick's bringing a bit of something else in and then... You yeah, very it. much, yeah. Like, yeah, I guess like, yeah, Mark would always like push us towards, you know, the um, yeah, kind of, you know, heavier kind of side of things. You know, he, the noise. You know, yeah, the no heavier noise. And then I guess I would probably go to most the pop way. But but then, you know, there was also songs like I would, I would like, I love big riffs as well. So, you know, I'd, Bringing that too, but uh, yeah, and Rick's Rick's kind of kind of mellow, and you know, we'll go with 
whatever we're, you know, either of us wants to do, really. <laughs> <laughs> but then, I don't know, like, Rick's big thing of the last 10 years has probably been John Bonham as well. So, you know, he always wants to slip in some John Bonham-isms in there too. Every drummer. Yeah, yeah, they can't help it. They just all do. You know, yeah. they're, all, they're all merely Bonhams. Yeah. You know. But uh, yeah, and this is fun. Like, I think, yeah, that was Mark wrote that entirely, you know, and it's, uh, yeah, you, you know, he's a huge Sonic Youth fan, so you hear that in there. Uh, speaking of songwriting, we should, while we, while we have time, um, talk about maybe where you are with that now and what might be coming up. Now that we're, please God, hopefully, you know, touch yeah. leather, um, <laughs> starting to uh, emerge from all this crap. Oh, no, it's a fake plant. Ah, <laughs> yeah. It'll do, it'll yeah, do. It'll do, yeah. We've sanctioned it. Um, yeah. yeah, so, because I, I remember you saying in an interview quite a long time ago, so things may have changed, but um, I remember you saying that the touring was getting in the way of the writing a bit because you can't really write when you're on. Now, some songwriters thrive when yeah. they're on tour. They love writing a song in the in the hotel room before they go down to the sound check. You're not one of those kind of writers, or at least you weren't. Yeah, no, I, I do like uh, peace and quiet, or just yeah. to be undisturbed, you know, that's, or not heard, you know. It's kind of embarrassing when you're sitting there, like, trying out things that are often really bad. So, you, yeah. We've got to wade through a lot of bad ideas before yeah, you get a good one. Yeah, right? so, yeah, so, as long as I'm not feeling self-conscious, I can kind of write, but it's kind of hard to find those moments on tour. I would imagine you've had plenty of those moments lately. Oh yeah, 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 a couple of years. Yeah, so is, is yeah. there a huge backlog of songs now? It's kind of, yeah, there's, um, well, we, when we were finishing Islands, we had a big bunch of songs. We started recording them before we started touring that album. And then life was kind of very disrupted. And, you know, I got, <laughs> got stuck all sides of, you know, sides of the Atlantic when I was living in New York. And, yeah. Um, so, yeah, probably an album that we should have finished uh, and should have been out, like, Two years ago, uh, we only finished like um, during the lot, you know, the lockdown, the winter lockdown, really. So there's one kind of done, and in the meantime, then we're working through recording the songs written since then. But I'm also like itching to write some new ones. <laughs> so yeah, there's you know, there's, that's, that's the thing, yeah, isn't it? Because that was then, but yeah. it did, maybe it didn't come out. But it was, it's still then. Yeah, yeah. I feel like you know, and there, there's all this talk about to make an album now. There's like at the minimum of six months to press a vi press vinyl. Yeah. And some people said 10 months, you know, so... Uh, well, I imagine what's... Uh, I mean, yeah. unfortunately, with this, the, the whole supply chain thing at the minute, that, uh, yeah. that, that maybe isn't going to improve for So, for cassettes it is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> From now onwards, yeah. Or you just have to play and have people turn up and hear them. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Like but the Sisters of Mercy, they just, yeah. they, they just oh. write new songs and then they that's don't make cool. records. Yeah, that's No, cool. please don't, please don't okay, make a record. Okay, we won't do that, yeah. Please do make a yeah. record. Um, but there could, there could be a few records in quick succession if we get our act together, hopefully. So There's lots of songs anyway. Good, and yeah. are they, have you any idea, because it, it, it has been so uh, all over the map musically, and I mean that in a really good way, so eclectic. Um, as I said in, in, in the introduction, everything from the, the pop punk thing to the metal thing, really, and the, and the uh, even electronic pop at one point, yeah. you know, very kind of sequencers and all that stuff. Do you already have a pre-imagined idea of what that's going to sound like, or is it a question of what you what it becomes when you get it into the studio? I think you, you sometimes start getting a little batch of songs together, and you're like, oh, this is a good direction to go to, you mm. know. Um, and sometimes you're we're feeding off what we just put out as well. So um, like Islands was quite a collection of like, oh, that, like every single song would have fitted nicely into the live set. You know, they work really well as a free piece. Mm. And uh, so then the, the record that we kind of finished is just really all over the shop style wise. Um, but then the new stuff I've been writing since that, <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like back to, you know, really live sounding things. So what about a sprawling double? Uh, yeah, thing? it could end up being that, yeah. yeah. I like, I like an old sprawling double. With an acoustic uh, side thing as well, who knows? Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Why not bring it all on? Um, we'll go with another single. Now, speaking of um, songwriting, uh, Rick uh, receives a, a co-write on Angel at the Separate. Firstly, yeah. um, w was it important to you as three friends who were, you know, school friends, yeah. and all this amazing stuff happens, this incredible stuff, this, literally the stuff of dreams. Uh, happens to you, I guess it must be important that, that everybody gets, you know, or it's yeah. nice to have everybody on the, on the, on the writing kind of credits. Yeah, of absolutely. Um, yeah, like, even, even any song that is, uh, says Tim Wheeler written, you know, on the, on the yeah. records, the, the guys have shaped them, you know, in, in, their, in their ways. You know, we, nothing goes on Nash record before we've played it a bunch and, every, you know, we've shaped it together. And mm. I never know what, which song is a good song to choose, but they're the ones who sort of go like, Oh, work on this, and 
then I kind of find what I need to, well, after we start playing it, I know what I need to do to finish the song sometimes. So, yeah, yeah so they're, you know, really a big, massive part of it. And, and then, yeah, like Angel Interceptor was, uh, I just was just notoriously bad at finishing lyrics. So yeah. Owen was like, you and Rick go down to the, <laughs> go down to the house and finish the song. So, you know, he helped me just finish the lyrics on that one. So. Right, and tell us a little yeah. bit of what, so what, what, I mean, is it, some songs aren't necessarily about any one thing. But yeah, is it, right? yeah, yeah, I suppose that's one of the least ones I can like pin on being right. about something, but I knew, um, oh, the Angel Interceptor, it was from, it's like one of his Joe 90 shows from, like, I loved from when I, when I was a kid. The Jerry Anderson. Yeah, Jerry Anderson, yeah, 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 it's from a Jerry Anderson thing, so uh, I just thought, oh, that's a great song title. So uh, I just wanted to write, uh, like, a, I guess it's a bit of a sequel to Girl from Mars, kind of, in a way. There's like kind of a, this yeah. uh, idealised, yeah. Unattainable person thing running through a lot yeah, of yeah, yeah. Well, I think I think it was a lot more down to earth. You know, there was a bunch of people who were like, "Oh, girl from Mars used to be girl from Ards." <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Why would I write a song about Ards?" <laughs> I mean, like, no offense to Ards, no, <laughs> yeah. or Ards in Donegal. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah, Ards that's beautiful in Donegal. Yeah, yeah. but uh, the whole point is, it's like a outer space thing. But I think it was, you know, those years when I'd like broke up my first girlfriend and you know I was like still like kind of missing all her and it was inexpressible so I think I chose to write about a girl from outer space instead. Right. So I think there was genuine feelings in there. I think that's why it connected in the end, you know? Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Okay, a co-write with the great Rick McMurray. Let's hear a third single from the album, 1977. Playing all the wrongs all the right songs, but not necessarily in the right order. Yeah. But releasing them as singles at any rate. Uh, yeah. Angel Interceptor, Ash. <laughs> and just like that. It's so my favorite part of that song. <laughs> the whoosh at the yeah, end. Well, yeah. the very end, you just, if you listen really quietly, you, you hear Rick going, woo. Oh, I did. I thought it was one of these people. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, good. that was, uh, yeah. That, that's what got him the credit, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I couldn't. I on, just... woo. <laughs> there you are. We're right at time. Actually, <laughs> I got a credit on another one song just for saying to John, maybe you should go to F there. It's like, eh. Ah. No, F. Hey, Red. Hey, no, that's pretty good. <laughs> and there it is, McLean. On that ah, song. brilliant. So, you know. F always dropping the that's F. That's how yeah. rock history is written. Yeah. Um, fantastic album, as we've just been. Well, a round of applause once again for 1977. Uh. <laughs> All those incredible singles. And um, it was a number one. A yeah. UK, a big, proper number one album. Yeah. That must have been just astonishing. And I believe you were the first Irish act to deb uh, with their debut album to go to number one in the UK. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct, yeah. I'm going to pretend that I knew that and you hadn't told me about <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, like, I, just, ma I just made it up. <laughs> well, yeah. good. It's a good yeah. one. It's a good yeah. one. Um, no, it was massive, yeah. It was, uh, I just can't even begin to think what that must have been like. Oh, it was crazy, yeah. And, yeah even, and it, as an, even as an, you know, considerably older than you, um, <laughs> that must have been mind-blowing. It was crazy, yeah. I guess, you know, the label was very clever of some of the marketing as well. They did stuff like the cassettes were on sale for 1977 prices. I think it was like uh -huh. 4.99. so uh, yeah, that helped. Swindle. Yeah, swindle. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you got free Frisbee if you bought it at Woolworths, things like that. But, um, <laughs> and then we still beat George Michael. He, he should have fought up the frisbee idea. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Frisbees weren't really very charged. No, they weren't. Uh, really, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If 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 someone had held onto that frisbee and not lost it in a tree in Brook Park in Derry yeah. somewhere, would would it be worth a? I think they're worth money? they're worth a decent amount. Yeah. And the cassettes. The cassettes maybe a bit less, but you yeah. Were, <laughs> I mean, you might actually made have made a profit though on the cassettes because they were so cheap when yeah. we sold them. Yeah. But, and you were also way ahead of the curve cassette wise. Yeah. I mean, That's right, people weren't doing them much at that time, yeah. It's funny because it was around that time where CDs were really where it was at. Well, it was actually getting quite hard to get vinyl. Yeah, yeah it's kind of, it's pretty rare. Um, we didn't, I don't think we did that many vinyl, but we yeah. were still vinyl fans, so we kept doing them for all the albums, and uh, even when people weren't doing them. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, yeah people are always ask me why isn't it repressed yet, yeah. and that's a kind of long story. But that's kind of what I was getting. Yeah, at. yeah. Okay, is it one of those big music business long stories? Yeah, it's, it's it, well, it's kind of yeah. We um, signed no, all. But I mean, if it is, we won't. Well, it's not that. It's, it's not okay. that long, but right. we, we signed everything to BMG, and the okay. game's just been taking a long time to do it. So I would encourage them to. BMG, to, uh, if you're watching this, get the finger out. Yeah, come on, yeah. Uh, people want. We to, need this on vinyl. Because otherwise, you have to buy it for sixty quid or something. Yeah, so, yeah. A noble effort, sir. I, pre I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> Um, so Lost, and you speaking of a string of, of, of kind of impeccable singles, Lost and You, for my money, absolutely should have been the, what would have been sixth 
Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, but it wasn't. Yeah, well, it should have been a single, yeah. But I kinda, it's great. Yeah, we all felt that too, but I think we felt we'd kind of rinsed it a bit much. And we're like, <laughs> let's... Uh, I know, you know, the, the following summer we came out with A Lifeless Ordinary for the movie yeah. and things things like that. So, uh, yeah, we, we we held off on it. But, yeah, it's one of my favourites from the album as well. And of uh, course, we should mention, you know, all these singles back in, the, back in the 90s, you didn't just put out a single with a B-side. You put out, like... Oh yeah, a single with like seven B sides. Yeah, you know, the... um, that kind of that came like the following album for us. It was right, more like okay. 97, 98. We were forced to do that, and then Rick actually f- like flew home in strike one day when we had to record some <laughs> extra B sides. So we had to like I had to play drums on one, and we got Danny from Supergrass to play on the other because Rick was like, "I'm not doing this shit." Yeah, put us <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't sign up for this. I, I really admire his like you know. And how was the drumming? Um, I was terrible and Danny was good. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Very yeah. But lost it, it kind of starts with that um, Strangers in the Night. Uh, I yeah. did notice. I mean, is that, that's, that's yeah. a bit cheeky. Like, it was he, cheeky. Well, yeah, I think that was the influence of hanging out with Owen Morris and the, yeah. the Oasis thing because they were always like just blatantly stealing things and using it as a, <laughs> as a jumping off point. So uh, That's true and fair. Yeah, but I, but I, I thought the rest of the song was got enough of it. Oh, got away with it, you know. It's totally its own thing, but you yeah. really ran the point home on the guitar solo. Yeah, think, yeah. Just in case you hadn't noticed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, anything to do with the fact that you were you were starting to reprise. In, in yeah, America. I think we got away with a couple of things, for, yeah. you know, for that reason. There was like, you were, Give them a break. We're on reprise in the States and then... I think also Infectious was owned by 20th Century Fox, which is how we could get the TIE Fighter at the start of the album without being sued as well. So, ah, yeah. right. It's all about who you know. <laughs> I thought you were just sticking the collective neck out. Yeah, yeah. Oh, very good. Brilliant stuff. Okay, what should have been, but wasn't, but it's still a beautiful song, Lost in You, Ash. like it uh, yeah lost in you as I say should have been a single and we're just talking about uh, you know the Sinatra thing and everything in reprise records apparently I heard that Frank Sinatra wasn't mad about the song that we're not going to mention the song that that sounds a bit like kind of slightly yeah you know what you'd have been in real trouble if you'd gone he wouldn't have liked the other one ever done <laughs> yeah. he would have loved that oh, okay good yeah. at least he didn't go Scooby Dooby Doo yeah yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that's what it was you'd have been in real trouble off, yeah. yeah absolutely <laughs> um, so look, listen this has been fascinating and brilliant and a real pleasure um, and we we are going to have another uh, acoustic uh, performance to finish off but uh, we, we've got to get to the, the, the closing tra- we're not, by the way in case you're wondering we're not playing that track yeah. Oh, I know which one you mean. Oh, come on, we'd have to sit here for 15 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a got a bucket? <laughs> <laughs> but talk, let's talk about, what was okay. that all about? Oh, yeah, talk, okay. In case you don't know, we're talking about uh, Sick Party, right? Yeah, there's a, I love that we even give it a name. There's a track called Sick Party, <laughs> which you buried exactly five minutes and 55 seconds after the end of uh, the final track, Dark Side, Light Side. Yeah. And, uh, I guess that was the era of like hidden tracks. Um, That's Nirvana, right. Yeah, yeah. Nirvana Endless had Nameless. And Endless Nameless, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nevermind and things like that. So, um, yeah, uh, we... I, it was one of Owen Morris's... <laughs> I'll blame Owen. <laughs> he's not we, here either. Yeah, no. we were... Uh, yeah, he's not here. Either. Yeah. Um, we were trying to do this... I think we were... I think maybe I was like stalling on lyrics for a couple of days trying to... And then everyone was like, we're really bored. So we started recording a track called The Scream, which was like... Uh, just us building up from it's the thing we used to do when we get into a lift mm. we'd just start like until <laughs> build it up until we were all like screaming but and we decided to make this like this big really long track of that and then we just got carried away and started recording loads of random stuff and one of the tracks was like Mark was like I, I'm feeling a bit sick let's record me vomiting <laughs> <laughs> and then so this was one of the tracks that was part of the scream and uh, then we just couldn't stop listening to it. Every night we would like, we'd be like, oh, when we needed a bit of like relief, we'd play the screen or um, sick party. Yeah. And then we're like, let's put it on the album. We thought it was genius. <laughs> and uh, maybe under some form of intoxication, certain band members were seen to be dancing to the vomiting track <laughs> as well. So uh, yeah, anyway, yeah. We're, I heard a lot of stories of people who would fall asleep, listen to the album and they'd wake up to hearing us puking and arrows or like be alarmed thinking that someone's breaking in or something, hearing voices in the distance. So. 
It know, wasn't our best idea. But. Uh, well, I don't know. But it, it, was, it was a weird sort of art imitating life or vice versa around that time. Because yeah. he, he did have a bit of a, you know, vomitous reputation. Yeah, 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 it really. Yeah. It was real. It was definitely real vomit. <laughs> then, yeah. The vomit was real, ladies and gentlemen. We're not playing it. Yeah. Uh, but you, I imagine you can, you if you really need to hear it, if you haven't already, yeah, I'm sure you'll you'll come across it. How many uh, people somewhere. vomited on the number one album? That's what I want to know. <laughs> yeah. Well, Eric Cantona wanted to spit on your single, yeah, so, you, yeah. you know, he was out done. Let's not go into it. any more bodily fluids. Yeah, spit we're... on our single, yeah. we'll vomit on the album. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the uh, final track proper, Dark Side, Light Side, I think it kind of, even the title alone sort of does sum up a lot of what we've been talking about, about this record, which is there's this kind of darker pull and then these yeah. kind of sort of sunnier, sort of, or seemingly sunnier, although a lot of them are kind of, Good, sort of sad yeah. uh, aspect to them as well, but kind of more poppy sort of stuff. It's a kind of a duality. That's certainly the case with this album and probably with the band in general as well. Yeah, and I think you, you're right, it sums it up nicely. And, yeah, and it's another like Star Wars reference as well. And yeah, it's, uh, yeah, and it, it, yeah, it's got a song that has this kind of, it's big riffy kind of song and then has a nice kind of sweet outro as well. So yeah, it's, uh, yeah I think you, you've summed it up nicely. It's, um, Star Wars, right? Were you, were you Team Empire or Team Rebellion? Oh, I guess Rebels, yeah, all the way. But Not everybody was. That's true, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Search your feelings, Tim. You know it to be true. <laughs> okay. Didn't know I could do that. <laughs> I'm terrified. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay, the dark side, well, wait, let's, let's stay on the light side okay, um, yeah. for this evening. But we're, we're, we're not done yet. Um, we're we're, we're going to get another uh, acoustic performance and a, and a little encore as well that we've uh, discovered we have to do. Uh, but uh, for the meantime, before we wrap it up, let's hear dark side, light side. I promise not to do my Darth Vader. I don't mind. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh! Hey. I was just about to say, is it? A nice little fade out. As it fades majestically to the distance, but you can hear it stop. You can hear we, it go. Yeah, mm. we don't oh. have many. Oh. We don't have many fade outs in Ash, but yeah. that, that's one of them. That's a good one. It's a ma majestically. I was yeah. It fades majestically, and then you hear it stop. Yeah. Um, you, you have to add your own sound effects. Uh, five minutes and what was it? Five minutes and five minutes, fifty-five seconds. And so on. <laughs> yeah. uh, Tim, this has been great. Thanks so much. Oh, thanks, really Paul. appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you so much. Um, yeah, thank, yeah, thank, thank you. you all. I'd also like to thank all of you uh, for coming this evening. Thanks so much, and also everybody here at the Grand Social, all the people on sound and the lights, uh, everybody else who's. Uh, Who's looked after us tonight? Um, <laughs> thank you. And uh, it, this is one of a special series of uh, intimate conversations. Yeah, that's pretty it's much what we had. Yeah, yeah. Intimate, <laughs> intimate, but in front of people. Uh, conversations, <laughs> and uh, it has been produced brilliantly uh, in association with Aidan Shortle of Up Close and Personal Promotions, and supported by the Department of Tourism, Culture, Arts, Gaelic, Sport, and Media. And I'd also finally like to thank the good folk at Hot Press as well. Tremendous work. Uh, anyway, for my part, thank you, uh, Tim, oh, for you, uh, the, uh, the chat once again. Tim Willier, folks. Um, <laughs> we're going to be hearing an acoustic rendition of... Girl from Mars. Do you remember the time when you were girl from Mars? I don't know if you knew that. Always stealthily playing cards and we went to see guys. She never told me her name. I still love you, girl from Mars. Sitting in a dreamy days by the water's edge on a summer night. Fireflies and stars in the sky, gentle glow and light from your cigarette. The breeze blowing softly on my face reminds me of something else, something that in my Place. Suddenly all comes back And as I look to the stars I remember the time I knew a girl from Mars I don't know if you knew that Always stealthily playing cards And you went to see cigars She never told me her name I still love you, girl from Mars Surging through the darkness over the moon a strand Electricity in the air Stirring all through the night I'm 
terrace Now that summer is here I know that you are almost in love with me I can see it in your eyes She's light shimmering over the sea tonight And it almost blows my mind And as I look to the stars I remember the time when you were gone from Mars I don't know if you knew that Always stay up with playing cards And you went to cigars She never told me her name I still love you, girl, from Mars Today I sleep in a chair by the window It felt as if you returned I thought that you were standing over me When I woke there was no one there I still love you Girl from Mars You remember the time when you were girl from Mars I don't know if you knew that Always stay up with playing cards and you win to see cigars She never told me her name Do you remember the time when you were gone from Mars? I don't know if you knew that Always stay up with playing cards and you win to see cigars And I still dream of you I still love you, girl from Mars Yeah. Backwards guitar solo. <laughs> yeah. Wondering. yeah. That was a good the thing was made, it was all made on tape so you could do that shit as well. Oh, yeah. Gotta mention that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pure. Yeah. Nasty. Yeah. Oh yeah, teenage lobotomy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I did I wrote it in like three five minutes or something. Yeah. John says he wrote teenage kicks in ten. Yeah. Yeah, you don't need much. I've got an idea. I'll do a little kung fu just to say goodnight. <laughs> it's only two minutes long, so. Thank you.